Welcome, and thank you all for coming out such a busy time of year and such a busy weekend for South Berwick. Um, we are so happy to have you here to celebrate with us this launch of the South Berwick Reporter website. Um, and I have to tell you that we just found out that our speaker, Alex Kingsbury, um, who is going to speak from New York today, is sick, and he's not up to it. So uh, Mary Pat Rowland is going to speak tonight, and also uh, we had two people who are here tonight who can step in, John Rudolph, who mentored Alex um, at the when he was young, a younger journalist, and Ralph Morang, who knows something about this local news desert topic. So, so we are, we're going to manage it anyway. So, um, this all started a while back, but more than a year ago, Amy Miller and I invited people to a meeting to have a conversation about the lack of local news in town. And out of that meeting, a few of us started to organize, and we were able to recruit a, a small staff of volunteers and routinely cover town council meetings and planning board meetings with the occasional other other event. And at this point, we've produced over a hundred articles. And And now have the website that will help us reach more people in South Berwick than Facebook. And it will also allow us to expand our scope. Um, the website is going to be free. Uh, we are going to have email subscriptions. If you'd like to have an email come in with the latest stories in your box once a week, you can sign up for that. And there will also be a, a new feature once we launch the website, which is now. <laughs> photo of the week. So if you take a, a great photo in town, of South, you know, somewhere in South Berwick and want to send it in to us, we'll post one a week. Um, I'd like to introduce our reporters now. We have uh, Zelda Kenny, And if you can stand up, that'd be great. <laughs> Susie Burke. Mark Pachenik, <laughs> is Mary Elizabeth Everett here? No, she, she didn't make, make it. it. She okay, didn't she's she's one of our reporters, and myself, our editor. <laughs> our editors are Nora Irvin, <laughs> Amy Miller. Our webmaster is Trish English. And our nationally known cartoonist is John Klosner. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of thank yous I could do. There were a lot of people who gave us advice and encouragement when we started this project. Um, uh, and, and I don't even know who all of they were. They were lots. So uh, Sobo Central is is key to our being a viable project, and they've allowed us under their umbrella, which gives us stability, and we don't have to manage the, the money part of things, which is very helpful to us. It, we can concentrate on news delivery this way. Um, they're the ones that will be taking any donations that you think you would like to to offer at this point. So you can always uh, just donate right on their page, put a little note that the donation is to the South Berwick Reporter. I'd also like to offer a big thank you to the Elliott South Berwick Rotary Club. They took a leap of faith when they gave us a very generous donation so that we could create the web page. Um, and, and we're very grateful for that. For that donation too. The last time we had local news in town was five years ago when Mark Pachenik was covering meetings for Seacoast Online. We've all watched newspapers get thinner 
and the uh, coverage of news outlets change as they are absorbed by corporations. Um, and their newsrooms were gutted. Murder, mayhem, and the occasional special feature about South Berwick are still covered in the regional news, but if you want to know about a development that's going up uh, on your road, you have to wait to see the orange stakes. Or if you don't have a child in the school system anymore, you may not know what's happening to the largest portion of your tax dollars. Information scattered and fragmented and we rely on neighbors and social media. And though we all know that the minutes and recordings of these public meetings are on the town website, very few of us make use of them. When we first started attending meetings, I could tell how uncomfortable the town staff and the board members were. <laughs> they were wondering, what? these people here for? I just felt bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and how is this going to affect the work we're doing? Remember, nobody had been reporting for five years and there was a pandemic in the middle. And we also had had a very large turnover in town staff. So we didn't know each other. We're much more comfortable now. And, and in fact, it's working very smoothly. Um, and I asked John James uh, to write a little piece about his take on the impact of the reporter on the town council. And he wrote back to me uh, this, which I'll read to you. The South Berwick reporter is exactly what our town has needed for many years. We have multiple projects being discussed and events being planned. The accurate and timely reporting has already proved to be invaluable to the community. What we're doing here with the reporter is happening all over the country in towns much smaller than South Berwick and in large cities that have lost their centuries old newspapers. We're doing this because we want to engage other people to be active citizens. We don't just want people to have an address and a home in South Berwick. We want them to be part of our community. <coughs> Heather Cox Richardson wrote last week about a World War II veteran who had written to President Eisenhower and, and asked him, would you please lead the country like you led the army? If, if you if you lead, we'll follow you as long as you're honest. Eisenhower wrote <laughs> back to the man, and uh, the part that stood out to me was this. While unity was imperative in the military, in a democracy, debate is the breath of life. People tend to support systems where they are free from the necessity of informing themselves and making up their own minds concerning these tremendous, complex, and difficult questions. We know how few people attend the, the municipal meetings that keep our town running. The reporting that we do can act as an antidote to our tendency to do the easy thing and tune out. It's about community, it's about civility and discourse and finding common ground among the 3,100 households in South Berwick. And it's fundamental to the health of our community and the democratic process. So all of this costs money. <laughs> Who knew I'd get to this? <laughs> In spite of the tremendous amount of time that the reporters and editors and webmaster and cartoonist spend um, on this project, uh, we have very expensive media insurance and a deductible, like $2,500 a year. And the website and email services cost money. We'll be exploring grants in the future, but we need your support now. Raise your, oh, this isn't for anybody who's on a board already. I see a lot of you out there, so this is not for you. Raise your hand if you've attended a town meeting of any sort this year. Okay, one a month. 
okay. How much would you pay not to ever attend one again? <laughs> So we're, we're hoping for sponsorships from businesses or individuals. Um, we have a banner on the homepage that uh, we have various amounts of time. You can read that over there if you want to know what the benefit for your business would be in terms of exposure. And, and any kind of contribution that you would like to make would be most welcome. Nobody cares about South Berwick as much as the people who live here. You folks wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't care about independent local news. So we're asking for your help to keep this going. Thank you. Can you talk loud? Yes, yes. yes. all right. <laughs> In a journalism career spanning more than 40 years, Mary Pat Rowland was a reporter, columnist, and for decades, the managing editor at Foster's Daily Democrat, where she was responsible for coverage of everyone from presidents to criminals to regular folks. Her unerring nose for news was legendary as was her training and mentoring of aspiring young journalists. The New England Society of Newspaper Editors awarded her the Judy Brown Spirit of Journalism Award for her work with rookie reporters. Mary Pat also received the Yankee Quill Award for her lifetime contributions to the newspaper industry in New England. For more than a decade, she served on the board and is a past president of the New England Press Association a trade organization offering educational programs, legal help, and First Amendment and legislative advocacies to its members. So here's a fun fact. Three of the South Berwick reporter staff, as well as, as uh, Alex Kingsbury, were employed by Fosters at various times during <laughs> Mary Pat's tenure. And one of them as an 11-year-old paper boy. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, it's been years since I've done anything like this. Um, truthfully, I'm a little rusty, so please bear with me. Um, also, know that I wrote a big chunk of this speech while watching Hotel Transylvania with my grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> so um, please pay no mind if I start to sound a little like Count Dracula. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be here tonight to celebrate the launch of the South Borough Reporter, the community's very own nonprofit news source. For me, uh, it's a homecoming of sorts. I lived on Old Fields Road for several years when my husband and I first got married, and Dan and I often walked the trails in Vaughn Woods. We called it going to church. <laughs> um, I'm also connected via the Sisterhood of Journalism to several of the wonderful people who started this project. Nora Irvine, Amy Miller, and I worked together at Foster's a lifetime ago. I also worked with Zelda Kenny when I was a very raw young recruit in my first newspaper job. Zelda was like a den mother to me <laughs> and always gave good advice. Um, the volunteers on this project deserve kudos and support from all of us. It's a very big deal. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have given thought to the bigger picture associated with this endeavor, but you should take a moment to appreciate it. You are now part of a growing national movement with enormous potential to resurrect journalism, bring vital information to communities and protect democracy. Take a breath, it's a tall order. Uh, nonprofit news sources are the greatest hope to save a dying industry. The odds continue to be stacked against traditional newspaper models According to the New York Times, around two newspapers close every week in this country. 
the country will likely lose one third of its newspapers by 2025. And that's an accelerated um, estimate. It was supposed to be a longer period of time. Um, Maine readers felt it firsthand in 2019 when the Journal Tribune in Biddeford shuttered its doors after 135 years mm -hmm. of continuous publication. The closure left a readership area of 40,000 people in two cities with no local news source. And that's happening everywhere. Now, nonprofits may be our best hope to fill that hole. Look no further than the great state of Maine to see how the trend toward nonprofit profit community news sources is growing. For those who may not be aware, last summer the National Trust for Local News acquired a majority of local newspapers in Maine, including the Portland Press Herald, four other dailies, and 17 weeklies. The Portland Press Herald hailed the move as a landmark deal that could help preserve local news across the state. In neighboring New Hampshire, which I'm more familiar with, um, there is in-depth newhampshire.org. It's a nonprofit watchdog news website published by the New Hampshire Center for Public Interest Journalism. According to in-depth New Hampshire's mission statement, they work to provide vigorous in-depth news coverage focused on government and public servants to hold government accountable. And just last week in Massachusetts, the Plymouth Independent, a nonprofit news source packed with former Boston Globe news veterans, began publishing online. The nonprofit news movement is also growing nationally. Membership in the Institute for Nonprofit News, a trade association that was founded back in uh, 2009 by 27 nonprofit publications, has now climbed to 425 members. So it, it's happening. All of this is incredibly heartening to me. Um, I poured my heart and soul into the news business. Five years ago, I retired from Foster's Daily Democrat after 43 years. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to have worked uh, in the industry in the glory days when revenue was rolling in and readers couldn't wait to get their hands on the Fosters, <laughs> as our loyal subscribers like to call it. In its heyday, um, Fosters held considerable sway on Main Street in the halls of state government and inside the Oval Office. In the 1992 presidential race, when George H.W. Bush was running against Bill Clinton, the economy tanked, and so did Bush's polling numbers. He called Fosters owner and publisher Robert Foster to help for, ask for help and an editorial endorsement. Several days later, the leader of the free world came to little old Dover, New Hampshire, picked up Bob Foster and his wife, Terry, in the presidential limousine and rode around the city for several hours. <laughs> the president got the endorsement he was seeking, but still lost the election. Presidential politics um, played a big role in Foster's success story. Bob and Terry Foster were staunch conservative Republicans and considered themselves to be kingmakers when it came to New Hampshire's first in the nation presidential primary. Every four years, presidential candidates, whether they be Democrats, Republicans, independents, or the fringiest of the fringe, made the pilgrimage to the newspaper's 333 Central Avenue in Dover, hoping for a front page story an editorial endorsement. All were accommodated. Our receptionist, a French-Canadian woman named Gil Fogarty, had a very historic register, which all of the candidates signed as soon as they entered the building. Most of the presidential candidates in the last 45 years, from Ronald Reagan, Bob Dole, Mitt Romney, and the Bushes, H.W., uh, and his son, George W., to Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton, made their way to Foster's for editorial board meetings in which we were allowed to fire off some very tough questions. 
It was New Hampshire's first in the nation primary that spurred the creation of Foster's first news website. Primary Destinations New Hampshire, established in 1995, was the brainchild of my brilliant former colleague and Foster's news editor, Phil Kincaid. Though Foster's had one of the first newspaper websites in the Northeast, that predominance did not last. There was a great deal of internal dissension about online news. Some editors did not believe print was ever going away. Uh, and others, including me, feared giving away the news for free online would do nothing to help us. The executive editor decreed that the news department would not share content with the website until after it had been published in print, a decision that had disastrous consequences for building online uh, readership and a future for the newspaper in a world gone digital. Most newspapers were doing the opposite, publishing stories online first and print later. Still, um, that edict had little effect on the bottom line at first. At its peak in the late 1990s and early 2000s, Foster's had a hefty news operation at its home base in Dover and bureaus in Rochester, Summersworth, Portsmouth, Exeter, Hampton, York, Maine, and the New Hampshire State House. There were numerous publications too, which were either created from scratch or purchased. The Rochester Times, the Portsmouth Times, and the Sanford News, weeklies in York, Maine, and Summersworth, Showcase Magazine, and Seco Sunday, our biggest project and highest revenue producer. During the glory days, when brick and mortar retail was flourishing and online shopping had barely begun, there were 45 full-time news staffers. And that doesn't even count the back shop where the paper was being put together. Dover alone had five reporters. When I retired in July of 2018, we were down to just two reporters for the entire Foster's coverage area. So that's, kind of shows you just what happened. Um, during the last 20 years of my career, I witnessed what I sadly call the great unraveling, the upheaval from the transformation to a digital world was every bit as monumental as Gutenberg's invention of the printing press. Malls and storefronts began to disappear as online shopping exploded. Newspapers, including Foster's Daily Democrat, were very slow to adapt and suffered huge losses as the business model collapsed. According to Pew Research Center, the newspaper industry hit a peak in 2006 of nearly $50 billion in advertising and circulation revenue. In 2022, that number had dwindled to $9 billion. Large-scale media companies like Gannett and Gatehouse bought local newspapers, including Foster's, for pennies on the dollar. Those newspaper chains, fully in the clutches of Wall Street banks and investors, not readers, laid off thousands of journalists covering small cities and towns across the country. Thus began the great news blackout, which you have all had a part of, you know, all South Berwick five years without any news. Um, with fewer reported, reporters, content diminished and critical investigative watchdog reporting was all but halted. That's where the South Berwick reporter and other nonprofit news sources come in. Nonprofits don't have to cater to vulture capitalists, hedge fund investors, or angry advertisers. And to be honest, I always believed the business model that sustained newspapers during some very profitable decades was terribly flawed. If you wanted to do a consumer story about some poor schmuck who bought a lemon at the local car dealership, the story usually got quashed for fear of the newspaper losing the dealership's precious advertising revenue. 
the marriage between newspapers and advertising is always shaky and compromised at best. The volunteers at the South Berwick Reporter will be free to report stories that truly represent this community. That said, it's serious and important work and needs seasoned guiding hands to ensure that writers adhere to the highest journalistic standards. Journalism may seem like it has all the discipline of the Wild West, but I assure you that is not the case. There is structure to the collection and writing of news. There are rules and ethics to make sure stories are fairly and accurately reported. I would never argue that journalism is high art, but it is a precise and deliberate craft with a steep learning curve. That's why the South Berwick Reporter will be ahead of that curve. Nora and Amy are steeped in the craft and can help volunteer writers with limited journalism experience to produce the best work. Foster's Daily Democrat was noted as a training ground and boot camp of sorts for raw journalism recruits who were just barely out of college and not actual fully functioning adults <laughs> many times. <laughs> We once hired a reporter fresh out of Middlebury College to cover Farmington, New Hampshire. Probably not the best fit. <laughs> Her first question to editors was, where are the squash courts in Farmington? <laughs> Boy, was she in for an education and some culture shock. Um, we also had a reporter who, after just one day on the job, came to work with his hand all wrapped in a bandage. When I asked him what happened, he said he had cut his hand while trying to make a sandwich. He was 22 years old and had never made one before. <laughs> I'm sure Nora could tell you more crazy stories about some of our brash young rookies. The point I'm trying to make is Nora has seen it all. Bring your questions to her. Nothing is too silly to ask. I'm confident you are all fully functioning adults and great sandwich makers, but journalism can be very tricky. Uh, for decades, um, Foster's Daily Democrat was known for covering the lurid, the gruesome car crash, the tragic house fire, the spectacular murder trial, because it's interesting, sold newspapers and was good for business. We sold thousands of extra papers and got thousands of extra clicks on the website during the worst of circumstances. The Pamela Smart murder trial and Lizzie Marriott murder come to mind. Also, the brutal 1997 murder of a 10-year-old ten, ten Jeffrey Curley of Cambridge, Mass., whose body was found in the Great Works River right here in South Berwick. Tragedies on a larger scale also sold papers. I was in the newsroom the day the Challenger exploded. I was also there for two Gulf Wars and as the horror of 9-11 unfolded. There were days when we ran on nothing but adrenaline. But as I've gotten older and have had the opportunity to look back, I'm most proud of some of our in-depth projects, like a series of stories on the severe lack of dental care for people in our communities, which I aptly named Nothing to Smile About. <laughs> we also did some amazing work uh, in a series about homelessness in the Seacoast region, and another story about how the city of Summersworth became the haven for the LG LBGTQ community. Nonprofit news sources have a great opportunity to skip the clickbait and do impactful work to inform the communities they serve. The South Berwick Reporter will not be looking to sell its digital content. Rather, its mission is to inform people about issues big and small going on in their hometown. It's a high calling and a lot of responsibility to get it right. If I could give you all one piece of advice, it would be this. Always keep regular folks in your mind as you pursue the news. 
it keeps you honest and it keeps you respectful. In my years at the news desk, I kept this quote by historian Will Durant inside my desk for perspective. I'm sharing it with all of you in the hopes it inspires your work for the South Borough Reporter. Civilization is a stream with banks. The stream is sometimes filled with blood from people killing, stealing, shouting, and doing things historians usually record. While on the banks, unnoticed, people build homes, make love, raise children, sing songs, write poetry, and even whittle statues. The story of civilization is the story of what happened on the banks. Historians are pessimists because they ignore the banks of the river. Don't ignore those riverbanks, folks. That's where all the good stories are. Thank you and best of luck with this exciting and important endeavor. Who's next? Rally for John. John. John? John's next. John Rudo. Um, let's see, I, I don't know if I can do a bio right off the top, but I know he worked for the Christian Science Monitor for a long time, and now he's running Feet Into World. Yes. All right. Great, thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I wasn't expecting to be here, up here <laughs> tonight. Um, but um, unfortunately, Alex, my good friend, and I mean that in the sincerest way, and my uh, former mentee is not feeling well. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to try to uh, measure up to him. And Alex has really risen to the very top of the journalism profession. He's on the editorial board of the New York Times, and um, uh, I'm, I'm so proud of him. Uh, but I want to talk just a little bit about the South Berwick Reporter and about journalism generally. Uh, the remarks that we just heard were, uh, were focused a lot on nonprofit news. I run a nonprofit news outlet, which I started 20 years ago, uh, called Feet in Two Worlds. Some of you are familiar with it. Uh, we, uh, we publish stories about and by immigrant journalists, and we mentor and train immigrant journalists. And we have a network of journalists who have gone through our programs all over the country and actually around the world, some of whom have gone back to the countries that they originally immigrated from. And uh, so, and, and Feet into Worlds is a member of the Institute for Nonprofit News, which was also mentioned which is an amazing organization, but not the only organization representing nonprofit news organizations around the country. So yes, I do believe that nonprofit news is a lifeline for the journalism profession and for bringing information to South Berwick and many communities, large and small, all over the country. I want to just share with you two um, uh, bits of news that have caught my attention as someone who runs a nonprofit news organization. So the first is um, a study that uh, just came out. Let me find it here. Um, I believe this was published last week by the Medill uh, School, Journalism School at Northwestern University. I'm just going to read it to you, and it kind of backs up what has already been said. The loss of local newspapers accelerated in 2023 to an average of two and a half per week, leaving more than 200 counties as news deserts, and meaning that more than half of all U.S. counties now have limited access to reliable local news and information. In addition, Medill researchers for the first time used predictive modeling to estimate the number of counties at risk of becoming news deserts, 
Those models show that another 228 counties are at high risk of losing local news. So this is a shocking and very dismaying uh, development. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin. Um, some reason for hope, which is an organization, uh, well, it's, it's actually a, um, a project called Press Forward. And Press Forward is a coalition of leading foundations, and I believe maybe some corporations as well, that have gotten together and pledged $500 million to support nonprofit journalism across the United States. And this is led by the MacArthur Foundation. And uh, I know that their ultimate goal is to actually get closer to a billion dollars in funding. Now that's not gonna solve the problem, but it's a good first step. And they are now generating their rules and guidelines and they will be um, uh, opening up their first round of funding early next year. And I'm certainly hoping that there's a place where uh, <laughs> the South Berwick reporter can apply for, for some of those funds. So, you know, we're talking here about journalism, but what is the purpose of journalism? Well, if any of you have studied journalism in college or high school, you know that the questions that we ask are what, where, when, why, who, and how. So what happened? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? Who was there? And and, and the reasons for, for it happening. So these are questions that we as consumers of news, readers of newspapers, television watchers, public radio listeners, we all wanna know. And so the journalists are out there asking those questions on our behalf. And the problem of being in a news desert is that there's nobody there asking the questions. Well, now we have the South Berwick Reporter, and those questions are being asked again, and they're important questions to, to ask and to answer. But it's really not about journalism. It's about representative democracy. And if journalism fails, representative democracy is at risk. It's at great risk. So to me, this is such a beacon of hope because it means that South Berwick, which I have always felt was a, a model of civic engagement. I mean, people in this town vote and they vote in large numbers. And many of you in this room, I know because I've served on town boards and commissions and so forth together, or I've seen you at meetings, or uh, you know, we've been involved in one way or another. So South Berwick does have a culture of civic engagement, but we haven't had a newspaper really ever, um, or maybe certainly not since I've lived here in, since the uh, early 80s. And um, so this is just a wonderful development. And I just want to say congratulations to Nora, to Amy, uh, to Karen, and to everyone who's been involved in this. And I hope that you all will support it. And you'll also talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors, and talk to them about the importance of having this voice and this source of information in our town. Thank you. That was pretty good for a spontaneous speech. <laughs> um, Ralph Morang uh, was uh, was some of he he uh, did a program at the Berwick Public Library probably a year and a half ago I think we figured out um, uh, they had uh, put together a video and there was a panel and you were exploring local news um, with town officials and Bill Nemitz was there as a speaker. And we had considered that a homework night um, as we were exploring, <laughs> forming the South Berwick Reporter. So Ralph definitely has uh, 
informed himself on this subject. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for this. I was asked to speak when I walked in. I have prepared nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Finished my beer, so I'm not totally relaxed. <laughs> um, I'm so happy that documentary did help spur the South Borough reporter, and I think with the staff, the town select board, the town boards, and the school boards are at will. <laughs> They'll be held um, to their responsibilities. Um, I'm a photographer. I worked for the Portsmouth Herald in the early 90s for four years. Um, I also did freelance photography. Back in the 90s, the Herald had a newsroom in almost downtown Portsmouth where there was not enough room for every all the staff members. Um, after I left, they moved to Pease. They had more room than they could use and less staff than they, could, they needed. And they recently sold that building. Um, I also was a correspondent for Elliott, Maine uh, for about three or four years until five years ago or so. And one day I sent in the agenda to the editor, the select board agenda. And he said, no, we're not gonna cover this one. And that was it. I didn't go again. They have not had a reporter there as far as I know since then. Berwick, where I live, used to have a reporter that covered, a full-time reporter who, whose job was covering Berwick Judy Curry, and then she was suddenly gone. We live in a news desert. It doesn't sound serious until you consider that we used to get news on our doorsteps. We could not avoid it. If you didn't want to read something about something, and it was on the front page, you read it anyway, because you couldn't quit it. So, um, I now work for Berwick Community Media, the cable TV station in Berwick part time. We talked about this lack of news coverage because a lot of our work is live streaming public meetings, select board, planning board, school board, board of appeals, all the boards. And we were concerned that not many people really watch it. I mean, not as much as got a newspaper 20 years ago. So we did this documentary, um, called it News Desert um, in a small town. And we just interviewed Judy Curry, the former Foster's reporter, another Foster's reporter, Brendan Dubois, who used to cover Berwick also many years ago. Um, he's done well. He's one of uh, James Patterson's partner writers. Um, and we discovered, we interviewed Bill Nemitz of the Portland Press Herald, and he talked about the Harpswell Monitor, which is a good model for this. The Harpswell, did I say monitor? Harpswell Anchor. Harpswell, Maine. It was a monthly newspaper owned by one gentleman who more or less did it himself, and he wanted to retire. Citizens were concerned that they wouldn't have a newspaper. So they got together and did this kind of thing formed a nonprofit to publish a newspaper. They do a monthly printed newspaper and online, of course, funded by grants and uh, donations and sponsorships. The sponsorships look like advertisements in the printed paper. So if somebody sponsors them, they get a certain amount of space in the paper for an announcement, which looks like an advertisement. That's something to think about. Um, the things to do, um, Judy Curry told us three things. There were three points that newspapers should provide. What you want, what a reader wants to know, what a reader needs to know, and what they should know. And what you want to know are the lurid things, murders, crimes. What you should know is like the roads are closed. What you need to, and what you should know are town meetings, voting, and elections, and all that. Um, Bill Nemitz said that newspapers are the cliff notes of history. So, four hour meetings boil down to something you can read in, in, a, in a few minutes. It's, it's very important to be informed. And like John said, 
it's the first bastion of the protection of democracy. If we don't know what's going on, we won't know what to do. So I think those are all of my <laughs> notes. <laughs> Let me check. Sue, anything else? No, but I thought um, I was with Ralph when we went up to the Harpsville Anchor to interview them, and they had, I can't remember the name of the woman, but she Janice. was, what, what was her name? Janice? Yes. But she had, you were talking about the money. He was like, we wanted to clone her for <laughs> every place like this because he knew how to get the money without compromise. Without having to she was a fundraiser for Harvard at one time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she might be a good contact if, when you come to the point where the model needs some funding, and you, they went after every grant, which you're already doing. But this whole thing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for coming. This is a way bigger crowd. <laughs> 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 so, um, lots of cookies.